Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio here in the hospital. In studio this morning is Dr. Jill Hooded. I got it right, Hooded. It's better than what she told me her maiden name, which was some very long thing I can't even begin to say. She is one of our outstanding primary care physicians and geriatricians. She is a corn husker, but we'll let her in the studio anyway. Joining us virtually is Janet Carlson Baker, the executive director of Kansas City Shepherd Center. We're going to talk about the impact of isolation during this pandemic on active and homebound seniors. It has been significant. Doc Hawk is joining us by phone as he is driving back from Colorado. Hopefully his, his reception is going to be okay. If not, I'll try and sub for him and myself. That could be interesting. He'll be back in the studio tomorrow. Hawkeye, I think things went okay over the weekend. What do you think? Yeah, I think they're doing, uh, they're doing pretty well um, in the hospital. Right now we have 12 active infections with four in the ICU. But unfortunately, three of those are on the ventilator and one on ECMO. So very, very sick patients in the ICU. We still have nine in that recovery period as well. Yeah, and I was looking. Are you driving right now? Are you multitasking? I'm on I-70, yeah. But I, it's hands-free. I'm, you know, safe. Okay, okay. Well, so I'm looking at the list, and just to say, we have a 41-year-old who's in the ICU, um, uh, not vaccinated, a 60-year-old not vaccinated in the ICU on a ventilator. There is a 62-year-old fully vaccinated with Pfizer in February and March on the ICU in the vent. I think this is the same patient we've been tracking who's had a lot of health issues, lots and lots of comorbid yeah. diseases. There's also an 83-year-old who's not been vaccinated in the ICU. And then there are um, a number of other folks, as you mentioned, who are either symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, only one who has uh, been vaccinated, um, who's 90 years old. The other people up there on the floors are all non-vaccinated. So by and large, nobody's yeah. been vaccinated who who's really sick except for one person. And then there is the patient who's 25, who's not vaccinated, 25 years old, and on yeah. both and ventilator and heart support called ECMO. So once again, out some, lots of proof that you want to get yourself vaccinated. So, hey, uh, yeah, Dana. You know, Steve, our, our two girls, I didn't think they had a shot. I guess they're alternatives. Come again? I would. Steve, I would say, you know, I, I would, I'm not a, a betting person, but I would, I would bet that most those infections are probably going to be the Delta variant right now. I haven't seen the latest updates on the prevalence of Delta in our community. Yeah. Um, and if not Delta, then for sure it's going to be that Alpha variant. No, I think that, that I think you're exactly right. I bet there there is a preponderance here of the Delta variant. Now, listen, there was some big news that came out from Nature magazine, or Nature, the journal Nature today, um, uh, about the success of vaccination with Moderna and Pfizer potentially giving us lifelong immunity. Did you see that? I haven't seen that yet. Um, I think that would be great. You know, it's, I think. Uh, I think we've already so far from the beginning of uh, the vaccine uh, for COVID-19 till now, we have continued to be impressed by uh, the amount of immunity, the efficacy and the safety. So, you know, that would not be surprising. Yeah, I mean, it is amazing information. And it, it's published out, um, I'm, I'm not going to say the, the investigator's last name correctly, but from Washington University in St. Louis, they published some earlier data that said immunity was great at six months. And they're saying, look, this 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 um, B cell germinal thing up in the armpit uh, looks real in the axillary region of your body. It looks really, really good. And that they think you yeah. may have lifelong immunity. And the reason to get a booster will be variants, not waning of immunity. That is remarkable, if true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was even better than with people who had been infected. And the strongest responders of what we already knew, if you had COVID and then you got, and then you got the, the vaccine, but really no reason to go get COVID. You can get a vaccination. You can potentially have lifelong immunity. We'll just have to watch for the rise in variants. That's some pretty important information, I think. In the meantime, what we're seeing worldwide, as the Delta variant spreads, the populations where pay, people had reopened, they're beginning to reinstitute more serious restrictions, even in Israel, going back to masking indoors because the spread of the Delta variant and so many people still not quite vaccinated. I think it just goes to prove that once again, we need to get folks vaccinated 
vaccination may last lifelong now. We'll have to track that story as it develops. But um, unless there's a rise of another variant that the vaccines don't work as well against, especially Pfizer and Moderna. They don't think it's true about J&J. They don't think it's true about AstraZeneca, although some more information coming out now, the AstraZeneca vaccine is not approved in the United States, that a third shot with that, the AstraZeneca vaccine may prove very efficacious. So you, they may want to start doing a third shot with uh, the AZ vaccine. So lots of information around vaccination today all of it really pretty darn good let's see if there are any reporter yeah, questions absolutely. i'm sorry go ahead hawk go ahead. Uh, you, so yeah absolutely and more to your point uh there was also uh, uh dr gottlieb uh was interviewed the other day and it was talking more about just as you had mentioned about israel and specific points uh specific places they're looking at more geographical hot spots moving forward so i think it's more imperative now that we have our community get as highly vaccinated as possible to keep um, keep from having those capacity issues and keep from having restrictions being placed on as well. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And you also can see, you watch um, the rise in Australia. They're talking about more restrictions again. They've been doing pretty well. A number of other countries are following. So I, I think we just have to keep a close eye on the Delta variant, and we got to keep people vaccinated. I think we get more folks we get vaccinated, the better off we're going to be. Let's see if the reporter question is out there this morning. I do have one from Donna Pittman. Actually, I have two, and she's with Channel 9 News. She says the Biden administration claims folks under 30 are the ones holding them back from reaching a 70 percent vaccinated U.S. population by July 4th. What push do you see, if any, that can be successful when it comes to getting Gen Z to get vaccinated? Gen Z, oh my gosh. I'm a baby boomer, barely. I think Hawkeye's a Gen X. So, you know, I, that's a great question. And, and Hawk, we can t tackle this together. But I think the key is just continuing to get the message out and having individuals spread the word from one person to another. I'm also going to talk to Dr. Hudet in just a minute about that question, since she's an internal medicine and a geriatrician, but she's also an internist. We'll see what she's thinking about it. But you know, I think this under 30 year old population may feel a little invulnerable. They may feel protected about it. So probably bad thinking as we witness the drop in age of patients hospitalized with the Delta variant. We mentioned Springfield went from the mid 60s down to 42. We have a 25 year old on really serious life support. No question that if you're young, you're vulnerable to the coronavirus Delta variant, Hawkeye. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, we don't want to say this because we don't want more morbidity and mortality, more illness and death. Um, it may be testimonials. It may be people who have it and their friends see what's happening and go out and get it. You know, um, we continue to get the message out because we know the safety efficacy. We know how well these vaccines work. Um, for the younger generation, it may be a little bit more difficult to get that message through to them. So, um, you know, hopefully there won't be further spread, but I think a lot of it will be if these young people see their friends and their family who have it and see people who are affected and they're, therefore then go out and get it and encourage their other friend groups to get it as well, either in person or we know how powerful social media is. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, Dr. Hudad, <laughs> what do you think in your internal medicine practice? What are you seeing from your patients and who's right. taking it and who's not? Right. So I, I think that you're right that our younger folks often have this sense of, you know, invulnerability. They, you know, they haven't had any issues so far, so why would they in the future? Right. Um, I do have younger folks coming in now that we're offering the, the vaccine in clinic saying, hey, you know, my, my mom or my girlfriend or my grandma, they really think I need it. So that's, that's why I'm getting the vaccine and wondering if I can get it now. Um, I also have, you know, 90 year olds who are never leaving the house, but they will go to a doctor's appointment. And so they haven't had the vaccine until now, but because of convenience and because they're finally in a place where they can receive the vaccine easily, they'll go ahead and get it. Yeah. So I think that's a good point. So all those girlfriends and boyfriends of the world <laughs> unite <laughs> and get your significant others vaccinated. That's I think that's the answer right there. What other questions do we have? You know, I thought she had two, but it was just the one. All so right. Good. Yeah. good deal. So now I'm going to talk to back to Dr. Hudad. Dr. Hudad, you're both a primary care doctor, a geriatrician. We mentioned that. How has the pandemic impacted your patients, especially some of our elderly folks who, as you mentioned just a moment ago, just didn't get out of the house? Right, right. 
So I see patients with increased frailty and cognitive impairment for the most part um, for my 60 plus population. So increased frailty and any dementia put you at risk for you know, more serious, a greater amount of long-term complications from COVID. Um, so you know, when we think of frailty, there are medical definitions for that, but we think of poor endurance, multiple comorbidities, uh, nutritional deficiencies, problems with their thinking. Um, and if you have any of those, then if you get hospitalized for COVID, your chance of mortality you know, goes up dramatically. And so the patients that are lucky enough to, you know, have made it out of the hospital, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of patients that have undergone, you know, months of rehab. Um, so people, you know, they might think of the, the risks of, of hospitalization with COVID, but you don't think of what comes with just being less active um, for a while or bed bound. How do you, you know, you spend two weeks in a, in a um, hospital bed, it's going to take you months to regain that physical strength back. And then um, speaking to the patients that, you know, might have some underlying dementia that, that then, um, or, or mild cognitive impairment that then get COVID, they might present atypically. You know, it might just be um, a slight change in their mental status that we need to look for in order to start thinking about, co could this be COVID? You know, do we, do we need to go down that path? So we've, luckily we've learned a lot, you know, in the last year about, how patients, older patients with delirium um, might actually have COVID, but that still needs to be something that we're thinking about in clinic and in the emergency department. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And, and do you think the social isolation led to more depression, more anxiety for, for especially our elderly patients? For sure. So there's, um, there's a, a term called um, Bed kitchen, bed kitchen sofa, and that's bed kitchen sofa. Yeah, and Got so it. this is this is what a lot of our, I mean, a lot of um, folks who don't have to get out of the house to go to work, you know, they they fall into kind of a no routine except for waking up at some point in the morning, going to the kitchen and eating, and then sitting back on the sofa, and um, when and you know this restricted social interaction because of COVID, you know, has, has really uh, prompted a lot of that. And we know that older adults are at increased, you know, maybe f more than 50% at increased risk for loneliness. And I see a lot of patients with loneliness right now that are, that are coming in and they're trying to figure out how, how do I feel comfortable getting back into the world, even if I've been vaccinated? So I, um, I answer a lot of questions like, you know, do I, do I still wear my mask? You know, can I go out to eat? Can I start going to the gym again or doing an exercise class? Um, but not being able to get outside of the house or interact um, has, has prompted a lot of uh, flares and in um, diagnosed or even, you know, newly diagnosed mental health issues, including mm -hmm. anxiety. Well, I can imagine that. I think I would be feeling terrible if I was isolated like that. And I'm sure a lot of our elderly are too. Right, right. So. Um, as you look at things, what are your biggest concerns as we go into the second year of our pandemic? Right. So I, you know, I, I think we're going to have to support our caregivers. Um, and I know that Janet's going to speak probably a, a bit to this um, in a little bit. But, you know, we have a lot of caregivers who are burned out. They, they have loved ones who um, had to be pulled out of adult daycare, adult day centers, because those were no longer open during, you know, COVID. Right. Or they've been, you know, keeping their loved one at home, um, ultimately knowing that, you know, they need 24-7 care, but, you know, they're worried, what, what will it look like if I put my, my loved one into a nursing home and I, they have to quarantine or I can't see them for a while. So caregiver burnout is going to be, you know, a, a big issue that we continue to address. Yeah, I think just that isolation is such a big deal. My 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 mother-in-law, who is me was like a mother to me because my mom died when I was very young. Yeah, yeah. So my mother-in-law, um, who I think is probably watching this morning, she watches this morning. So I'm not going to say how old you are <laughs> this morning, Nani, but um, she's somewhere north of 85, but south of 90. So that that's kind of gives you a little bit of a range. She yeah. she uh, she's over at Bishop Spencer Place. They've done a great job um, of, of trying to take care of folks there. They've had very little outbreak, but I think. 
I think she would say that that isolation has been hard. We've been trying to Facebook or FaceTime or T, Zoom and all that. And having her get back to our house and we're we're all together last night for Sunday dinner with our kids, that's just like the best thing right there and having that family contact. I can't imagine having to have done that for an entire year and just not having contact. That's really difficult. You can look or read so many great books and television just drives you crazy after a while. Right. Right. Yeah, I took my three daughters to church for the first time a few weeks ago, and I cannot tell you how many older individuals we had come up and say, oh, my gosh, it's so good to see a little kid again. Yeah. I had, yeah. I had one patient who said she, um, she was in, she's in assisted living, but she hugged a teddy bear that her granddaughter gave her every oh. day for 10 months because she wasn't able to hug Anybody. You know, a real person yeah, uh, that's during tough. that time. That is tough. Yep. Well, let's talk to Janet Carlson Baker. She she is a director of the Kansas City Shepherd Center. Janet, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about the KC Shepherd Center. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I could just listen to you both talk about this all day. But um, I am really pleased to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about KC Shepherd Center because we exist for the sole purpose of lifting up older adults, of serving and celebrating them so that every person is seen, heard, and respected. And this pandemic has uh, just about put people uh, in an untenable situation that we serve. We are the original Shepherd Center. There are more than 50 across the country now, but uh, Kansas City Shepherd Center was founded in 1972. We're getting ready to celebrate our 50th anniversary next year. And um, we were founded by a Methodist minister, uh, Dr. Albert Cole at Central United Methodist Church, who looked around his congregation and saw his members aging and retiring and realizing you've got 20, 30, maybe 40 uh, years of of life left, what are you gonna do with it? And so he founded Shepherd Center with the idea of keeping older adults engaged post the work world or post raising their children. Um, And we do that in a number of ways. We do that by providing volunteer opportunities to older adults to keep them vibrant and and other centered and engaged. And and I really appreciate the term, uh, Dr. Hooded of bed, kitchen, sofa. That's a cycle that is just so devastating uh, to older adults. And then once we look at the whole person and the whole uh, integrated continuum of care model of aging, then we we realize that as people age through the process uh, and may no longer be able to deliver Meals on Wheels, maybe they need to receive Meals on Wheels. Maybe they're no longer able to be a senior companion uh, to a homebound older adult, and they may need a senior companion. So our hope and intention is that we have uh, a relationship with older adults from their early older adulthood all the way through end of life. Yeah, that is a, that is a really special organization, and we just want to say thanks for reaching out to folks and and uh, and having this great this great organization. Um, how do you think COVID-19 impacted the people you serve? I appreciate that question because my answer is um, the people that we serve, first of all, aren't your mother-in-law, aren't uh, your, your parents. They're the, primarily the people who don't have that kind of a supportive family system. So um, what we realize and have, have known all along is that those individuals were socially isolated before COVID and they're going to be socially isolated after COVID. Um, We do know that social isolation, first of all, social isolation kills. Um, It's not just a nice thing to do to keep people engaged and active. It does increase anxiety, depression, loneliness. um, and, And on the next slide, you'll see a little more about the details of how it actually can, um, Increase, it does increase dementia by 50%. It increases mortality by 40%. So that if you don't have a family system, you don't have a healthcare advocate, you are alone, you're, you're the bed, uh, bed, kitchen, sofa individual, and you do get sick with many things, not, not the least of which is COVID, your mortality is much more likely uh, to increase than, than those that have supportive family systems. Uh, So we are uh, very focused on the physical and mental and uh, and emotional impacts of social isolation. I think this statistic 
says more to me than anything else, and that is that social isolation is the physical equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And nobody does that anymore because we know how devastating that is. So what I want to get across is that um, providing programs that engage older adults like we do uh, through our Adventures in Learning program, through Meals on Wheels, our volunteer drivers that, uh, that get to spend time with the older adults, all of those things sound like, oh, isn't that nice that they do that? No, this is clinical, it's scientific, it's important, it's science-based, and, um, and we're saving lives, and, and that's what I would want people to understand about Shepherd Center. Um, we also know that uh, it, it is expensive. Social isolation is incredibly expensive. It costs Medicare $7 billion a year because of those comorbidities of social isolation. I just made that up. I may, Maybe that's a thing, social isolation comorbidities. I think it's um, true. The, I'm sorry? I said I think that's very true. Social, yeah. uh, social so, isolation um, will cause comorbidity, or I'm emphasize sorry. the ones you have. So in terms of the number of people that we serve in Kansas City, uh, we know that the over 65 population is the fastest growing population, has been for a number of years. Right now there are about 320,000 uh, individuals over 65 in the Kansas City metropolitan area, which is on track to double um, between 2010 and 2030. So we're halfway to, uh, to that doubling. Um, that's a significant number of people and we can't do it all. Um, but we do our best to uh, serve who we can serve, but also partner with other organizations who serve older adults so that we can truly have a continuum of care in Kansas City around uh, older adults, which I don't believe really uh, exists. We have a number of great, great programs, great organizations, uh, and great funders, but that it's not a system, and I'd like to be a part of creating that continuum. Um, the other thing I would mention about Shepherd Center, uh, in addition to what I already stated, is that this is a revolutionary peer-to-peer -peer model. In 1972, there were not a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, models out there, but Dr. Cole was a visionary, and his idea was not that we are a social service agency providing services to older adults. Instead, we facilitate older adults serving each other. So that has that double benefit of keeping people engaged, giving them purposeful living, uh, as well as serving those who are in need. Uh, and when we need your help, quite frankly, I will tell you that COVID uh, really, it, it was an, an interesting experience to see a small window of opportunity where people were paying attention to the plight of older adults and especially isolated and, and, um, and vulnerable older adults. But I, as I feared, that attention is waning. We're kind of in the moment of getting back to some sense of new normalcy and uh, funding communities, uh, donors, uh, et cetera, are starting to go back to puppies and babies. And I love puppies and babies. Um, I'm a mother and a grandmother, but at the same time, we all have mothers and grandmothers. And my intention is to ensure that we keep the focus on the older adults who need our help and, and who don't have the family structures in place to, to provide that help, those resources, um, and the financial uh, support to be able to live uh, outside of this social isolation. So if anyone would be interested in supporting the work that we do, we truly could need uh, could use your help. Quite honestly, it's wonderful to say, well, I want to I want to support Meals on Wheels or I want to support Senior Companions, and we need that and love that. But to be completely frank, if we can't keep the lights on and the staff paid, I can't provide those services. So those unrestricted donations to support KC Shepherd Center at kcshepherdscenter.org slash donate uh, will help us help us with some of the insane growth we've experienced during COVID. One quick example is that our Meals on Wheels program in March of 2020, we were serving 50 older adults a day. Uh, we are now upwards of 500. Hmm. We were one full-time staff person. We now have five getting ready to hire two more part-time drivers. We have three refrigerated vans and 80 volunteer drivers. So that's capacity building that uh, we need as an organization to have support 
to be able to serve more people because even at 500, we're barely scratching the surface the surface of food insecurity for older adults in Kansas City. Uh, that's a remarkable story of what the great work you all have done. You got some pretty cool bracelets there in a the picture. Talk to us a little bit about the bracelets. Whose idea was that? Well, we were we were very concerned about, uh, as Dr. Hooded says, uh, the the people that we serve being worried about coming back out into public. And even if they have their vaccines, should they wear their mask? Or uh, you know how how will people know I'm vaccinated? Um, I'm, I don't want people to think that I'm walking around without a mask and being irresponsible. So we came up with these very simple little um, I'm vaccinated bracelets and I have them available. They're on our website as well. Uh, we decided to make that a community service rather than, than charge for it. So that's where those donations would be very helpful. We were overwhelmed at the response. I ordered 1,500 of them. They were gone in a day. Um, we got some terrific media coverage over it. Um, and then I ordered 5,000 more, and we only have about 800 of those left. So we will keep putting them out into the community as much as people want to wear them. And ironically, we have, I know your following, following is immense. Ours is not quite so big, but we have had orders from 28 states uh, and all over Kansas and Missouri. So we're ecstatic that this has resonated in a way that uh, people want to be able to to wear their I'm vaccinated bracelet with pride. You know, that's a great story. And you guys have really done terrific work. Dr. Hudad, this sounds like a way to break that triangle of loneliness you described earlier today. Right. And I, I, I agree. I love the idea. I, um, I think it's, you know, these bracelets or having some way to show that you've been vaccinated might just give enough of a, a confidence boost um, to to some of our older individuals or family that's with them to kind of get back in a safe way um, into the community. Yeah, do you have one of those bracelets? I, I don't have it on. Uh, but you've but got I do, one. I've got more than one. All right. Well, I expect you. I need one of those. That sounds pretty darn good. I've got you covered. All right. And, and, well, and if I could, Dr. Stice, could I, I interject that uh, Dr. Hooded actually has a whole bag of them for her patients, <laughs> and I think that's a terrific way for uh, doctors to provide their patients that they know they've been vaccinated. Now, let's be very clear about this. We're not just handing them out to anyone. You have to be able to show that you've been vaccinated. Uh, we're not keeping anyone's information, but if you will uh, show your card, you get, a, you get a bracelet like at the Price Chopper event. But we have had orders from more than 30 organizations, including school districts uh, and and a number of different organizations who want to provide them to their employees. And I think that's a very good idea because I know when we go to restaurants or we're starting to branch out just a little bit as a family, um, I, I wonder if the people serving me in the restaurant, you're not wearing a mask, are you vaccinated? So it would be helpful to have employers uh, offer these to their employees as well. I think that's very true. And we have to remember that the studies that show the great success of Moderna and Pfizer and J&J &J here in the United States also excluded some patient populations from study, like some transplants and other things. Are there just weren't enough of them to make a comment? We know that being vaccinated keeps you safe, but you, if you have a lot of comorbid illnesses, it may not be quite as safe. We see that in the hospitalization numbers as well. Not to say vaccination doesn't work. Vaccination works great, no question about it. It just means you gotta be smart and you wanna stay safe. And it would be kind of nice to know if that server has been vaccinated when they're bringing the food over, especially if my mother-in-law's with me. All right, Jill, let's see what questions are popping out there in the community because I bet there's a lot of pop here. Yeah, there's, there are some questions. Jackie says, we're having a hard time re-engaging our seniors on our senior independent property. Prior to COVID, they would come to the community room and have their meals. Now they just want to do meals on wheels. She says, any ideas on how to get them re-engaged? All right, I think that may be true even where at Bishop Spencer Place, folks aren't going over down to the, cafe, down to the dining room as much. What do you think? Right. Well, I think that, you know, there's probably ways to do this in phases or in steps and, um, you know, reassuring residents, um, such at the facility that you're um, referring to, um, that, you know, maybe you'll start with just two individuals per table um, and we'll keep just those two individuals together for several weeks. 
Um, and then maybe, you know, expand it to the same four individuals or do things in pods um, and in smaller groups. See how things go first uh, and, you know, continue to roll out in, in such a manner. Yeah, that would be great, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna bet uh, that Casey Shepherd's uh, Center has heard this concern as well. How do you get people reengaged out in the world? How do they stop having so much fear? You know, I think that we're going. It is going to be an evolution, and some of the things that we have done in response to COVID uh, for our Adventures in Learning program that for 47 years was an in-person uh, all morning program. We've now gone online. We're serving more people because we can reach more. Um, and we are going to be returning to some, uh, and have already started returning to some in-person programming. But we're doing it in very small groups um, and socially distanced. And we know that the people who are coming are vaccinated and, and making that a request. Um, and, and then in the fall, we will be as Dr. Hudit says, gradually increasing the size of groups that we are uh, engaging in in-person activities. Uh, I would say in the senior living facilities, the, the person on property who knows more about how to engage the older adults is the service coordinator. We have a program committee led by a board member uh, who's the service coordinator at Westport House, Adair Stewart, and, and, a, and a number of other service coordinators from across the city. And I will take this issue to them. They are terrific at diagnosing, you know, what's going on in their properties and how to engage people. And they have started opening up the common rooms a little bit, but, um, but it, it, it's just going to be a comfort level that people have. And I don't believe that there are, that I, I believe there are some people who just won't be comfortable coming back into group settings, especially older adults. So I think it's important that we find ways to serve them where they are. Um, we consider ourselves a community center without walls in that what, everything that we do is either in your home or, or close to your home in, in some way. So I think that's it's a combination. There is no silver bullet, and I think it's a combination of finding ways to serve people uh, where they're comfortable. I think it's so important, too, to get people back exercising again. And so even that walk down to the community center makes so much sense or down to the dining room and mm -hmm. just making sure people aren't too debil debilitated to make that walk. Because, Dr. Hudad, we know that exercise is incredibly important as we get older, perhaps more important than when we're very young, like me. Right. Or maybe not. Right. And there's, you know, there's a, a lot of postulation um, about, you know, over the next five or ten years, are we going to see an increased rate of falls amongst our older adults because they – have been living this very restricted lifestyle during COVID. Yeah, I, I would be worried about that. Okay, we have another question on topic, and then we have a few for you and Dr. Hawkinson All right. on uh, COVID matters. So um, Cindy says that she drives for Meals on Wheels, and she's just wondering from talking with some of her clients, is part of the fear because they lost so many friends and neighbors to COVID early on? Well, that would make sense. What do you guys think? Oh, I'm sure. I mean, I think we all... I, I don't know, I'd be surprised if um, not everybody has a, a story to share about somebody that they know. I, you know, my father-in-law was hospitalized. He was intubated for more than 40 days. He oh, was, my. It was a five-month back and forth from COVID the ICU. COVID-19? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I feel like we all know somebody like that. So um, I'm, I'm sure that that is some of the fear that um, is resonating with folks. And did he recover? He did. We just awesome. had a big celebration last week. Um, he's walking without oxygen. And Yay. It's, it's great. But, you know, it, it um, has made our family, you know, uh, think about things in a different light. And I hope he's been vaccinated now. Oh, you sure Absolutely. Have, as has everyone else in our family. Yeah. Jenna, what are your thoughts around this question? I think it is, it, there is no one silver bullet again. I think it's, uh, it's probably a combination of factors. I totally agree with Dr. Hooted um, that everyone has a story now. That also reminds me of those under 30 year olds that, and, and how the more relationships they have where they know of someone, their parents or their grandparents or whatever, maybe that will be the incentive they need to protect themselves. But I think another factor in the fear of, uh, of leaving home for our Meals on Wheels clients who are, are by uh, definition more vulnerable, either physically or cognitively or, or for some reason unable to prepare their own meals, 
um, is that there's been so much media about how COVID has affected older adults more so than any other demographic. And they're trapped at home and what they have is their TV. So my, my, I surmise that they are, there's a lot of fear that's driven just by how much media they've seen on the devastation COVID has had on older adults as well. For sure. And Jackie says, thank you. She says, I am a service coordinator. One thing we are going to try in July, sponsored by Rick Creek of Ottawa, is one day a month in the arm, free donuts and coffee for those who would like to begin to socialize. And Isaac asks, are you, is the Shepherd Center giving out vaccines directly? No, we are not a uh, clinical, we are not a medical organization, but we have been so fortunate to partner with some terrific uh, community health partners. Early on, we partnered with uh, Truman and did a testing uh, clinic in our own parking lot, as well as um, provided our uh, our mobile older adults with access to vaccinations through Truman, uh, through Casey Hospice, and uh, and other community partners. Then we were really fortunate because one of the the most concerning aspects of this from day one for me has been how do we reach our homebound older adults with vaccines. Um, and we were able to partner with the Kansas City Health uh, Fire Department and they have a brand new community medical response team that will go to people's homes and we were able to provide them with the clients, uh, our clients, and then we opened it up to the public and we have been very fortunate to facilitate uh, vaccinations for homebound older adults to the tune of 250 or 300 individuals, as well as uh, all of our volunteers and our staff and our board and our community partners, our participants and clients who are mobile have taken advantage of the other opportunities that we have. But no, we are not a clinical uh, organization. We don't provide vaccines. Okay, Pab wants to know, is there a test to check for natural immunities to COVID? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. Hawkeye, you and I could tackle that as well. I think the only thing we could do is to make sure you could check the spike antibody um, uh, uh, and you can get to see if you've got that. And, and, and the, what you don't know is if you've been vaccinated, if that's a naturally occurring antibody or not. There's another antibody that you can test, which is a capsid antibody, which does not measure the spike. And that's only true because when you've been vaccinated, you only make the spike protein. So if you make the capsid antibody, then in that situation, then um, the uh, uh, immunity was only from having had COVID-19. But the one we're using now in the health system, as an example, only measures a spike antibody, so you could be positive either from natural infection or from uh, a vaccination. Hawkeye? Yeah, you know, I agree totally. Um, there is no actual test for immunity. Um, there are no known correlates of immunity. What I mean by that is even if we test your antibody, we at the health system, most commercial labs don't test the level of antibody. Um, there is still very uh, distinct guidance that we don't know the full correlate of immunity. What that means is we don't know what antibody level is protective. Um, there are also commercial tests to look at T cells, but those tests are only looking to see if you've had exposure or infection from COVID-19. They aren't testing the level of immunity. So a quick answer to that is no, there's really no test to look at your level of immunity. But also remember, um, a natural immunity response is for antibody levels to wane after some period of time. The big thing about our immune system is we have that memory. So we have the B cells that create those antibodies. Those are still circulating. And if you come into contact with the virus again, those B cells will be activated to then produce antibodies at high levels. The same thing goes for the T cells as well. You have the memory function. So if you are exposed or are infected with the virus again, those T cells will ramp up their immune levels. So the short answer to that question though is, no, there's really no test to look at immunity per se. 
You know, it's interesting. I saw in one of the articles I read this today about um, about the the study being published in Nature about long lasting uh, uh, the durability of immunity from vaccination. Uh, they, they they took these germinal centers or the bone marrow where the T cells are being programmed and set, talked to them a little bit as schools or re-education. You get educated the first time that your cells were learning about COVID-19. The next time if you get exposed again or you have another challenge, then the school takes a lot less long because you've already learned it once and so you ramp up so much faster. So it's kind of like special programming or yep. for in my case, uh, you know, special education for COVID-19. Jamie wants to know, can you tell me yeah. how the vaccination can affect the young ladies who are holding off getting the vaccine so that they can have their kids? They're worried about defects down the road. Yeah, Haka, I think that so far what we're seeing is vaccination is very safe for pregnant moms, very, very safe, and certainly far safer than getting COVID-19, which can make you really ill and really cause birth problems. Yeah, exactly. Get vaccinated. Get vaccinated now before you're pregnant or get vaccinated while you're pregnant. You will then, as mom, and we've had good data about this, be able to transfer some of that protection, those antibodies, to uh, to your child. So it's very important to get, in, to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Obviously, with anything, you as an individual, talk with your medical provider about that. But the general guidance and recommendation is to get vaccinated as soon as you're able to. So, Dr. Who did, as you look through that and you think about this with your young patients, have you had anybody coming in who's pregnant and said, uh, I don't know if they get vaccinated or not? Oh, for sure. Um, and uh, I, was, I was actually one of those folks. I was pregnant during the beginning of COVID. Okay. And then the question was, okay, now, you know, I'm a nursing mom. What do I do? Do I get vaccinated or not? But I, like you said, I think we know enough now that, you know, we're starting to get more and more data where... It's much safer to be vaccinated than, than not. Yeah. Three girls. You need to be vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> got, that was a lot of work. I had two girls and a boy. And I want to tell you, when we switched from two to three, it was going from a man to man to a zone defense. That was tough. Michelle says, with the Delta variant becoming more widespread, will vaccine manufacturers be changing the vaccine for children who are younger than 12? Any data on how much the current vaccine protects against it? So far, what we know, Hawkeye, is it may not be quite as good, but at least the mRNA vaccines appear to be very good against it. Let's remember that when we first started looking at vaccination for coronavirus and COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, we were hoping for a 50 or 60 percent success rate. Nobody dared to imagine that we would be 95 percent as the Pfizer Moderna vaccines are. And so the Delta variant may be 85 or 90, but it's still incredibly good. So, so far, I think it says so good if you've got the mRNA vaccines. And I think the J&J &J vaccine is proving to look pretty good as well on the COVID-19 with the Delta variant. Hawkeye. Yeah, the vaccines are still, you know, very good up against protecting, protecting against that whole spectrum of disease symptomatic disease, but especially severe disease and death. Um, you know, I think we do expect the vaccine companies to pivot based on certain variants uh, or spikes to help uh, maybe optimize protection. We know that Moderna is looking at a spike from the uh, South African or the beta variant, I believe. Uh, but it's just, I think it's still kind of waiting to see ultimately what they do and how they do pivot with those spikes. And maybe even, as we've seen with influenza vaccine, where there are four strains in a vaccine, maybe putting one or two or three spikes in, uh, in one of those mRNA vaccines as well. Yeah, I, I'm not concerned. So I, I wouldn't doubt that the mRNA vaccines do and the J&J &J vaccine, but it's just easier for the mRNA vaccines. Um, I don't doubt that they are going to pivot a little over time, um, but I wouldn't be concerned so far because so far all the vaccines are the, the two messenger RNA ones and the J&J &J appear to work against the four major variants that are out there uh, all the way through the Delta variant, which is the one from India. Lindell wants to know, what about those who have had COVID and recovered? What kind of resistance do they have? Yeah, that's a great question, Hawkeye. And I think that's kind of open to debate that the Delta variant may be reinfecting some of the patients who have already had COVID-19. You don't have quite the broad-based immunity you get from vaccination. Yeah, exactly. I don't remember the references uh, off the top of my head. But I, I think the major opinion is that your immunity uh, after natural infection, especially 
if it was before the turn of the year when there wasn't the prevalence of the alpha variant and now the delta variant your natural immunity probably is not as great in protecting against that wide spectrum of disease as the vaccination is. Yeah, so the answer to this question is get vaccinated. We've never said that. Never have we said get vaccinated. That, that's new. <laughs> that would be sarcasm for people who might. Yeah, that might know, know me. They may is. not okay. know me. A little I'm gonna, we have lots of questions. I will save the ones that we have today, and I'll start with them tomorrow. But Sharon wants to know, if a person had severe COVID in November, they had to be on oxygen with pneumonia in both lungs, and then they have the Pfizer two doses in February, do you think that would be like having a third dose? Are they extra, extra protected? I don't know if it's a third dose or not. You don't really need a third dose of the vaccinations, but the data suggests that for people who had COVID-19 and then got vaccinated, that you have incredibly long-lasting immunity. Uh, I wouldn't go do that. Yeah. That's an experiment you don't need to try because really the two vaccinations do great yeah. by itself. We referenced at the beginning of the program with an article that's coming out in Nature. But um, there is really strong data that says you have overwhelming immunity if you've had COVID and then you get vaccinated, Hawk. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been a, a few references that have shown that uh, if you get the first dose after you've had infection, your antibody levels, again, we don't know the full correlate of protection of those antibody levels, but your antibody levels after that first dose and natural infection are similar to what it is after two vaccine doses. But again, the guidance still for those mRNA vaccines is to go complete that two dose series. All right. Well, this has been really informative. What great questions we've had this morning. Oh, hey, you think those are good? You ought to see the so two that, or three that just came in. They're all right. Gonna, we'll be out trying tomorrow. to stump you tomorrow. We'll be, okay, I'll be ready for that. <laughs> hey, tomorrow we head out to the Olathe Fire Department. And by the way, this is going to be a PG-13 promo. There it goes. I got, geez, they blew up, and I didn't even get to give them a hard time about it. <laughs> all right. So we head out to the Olathe Fire Department. Where firefighters are going to give us a demonstration on the danger of fireworks and share some stories People remember fireworks are dangerous. Be careful out there. In studio, we will have the medical director of our burn unit, Dr. Deval Bashaver, in studio with advice on what to do and what not to do if you or someone you love gets injured. I'm sure I didn't do that last name correctly. I'll be better tomorrow. And we'll talk more about keeping you safe from COVID at public celebrations. Final thoughts. Janet Baker Carlson, the direct, executive director. I said that wrong. Janet Carlson Baker, the executive director of Casey Shepherd Center. Final thoughts for today. Well, I, first of all, thank you again for this opportunity. I hope that this gets shared uh, far and wide about the importance of reducing social isolation and, uh, and ensuring that our older adults are vaccinated against COVID. We're doing our best. I would not be an effective executive director if I didn't make one more plea for support at caseyshepherdcenter.org slash donate. So any help would be welcome, especially as we are in uncharted territory ourselves and, and trying to um, trying to serve more people and uh, with the same resources and, and in some cases dwindling resources. So we are very grateful for the community support. You bet. And as one lesson we know is that the pandemic was not free. And so the support people get from organizations like yours is outstanding. It's incredibly important. And so just a shout out to all the great work that you and your team have done. And yes, let's support Casey Shepherd Center because they have done great work at all the folks who are at home and, and other places and can't, can't get back out in the community. COVID-19 has taken a toll. Certainly, it has not been a free lunch. Dr. Jill Houdet. Thanks for being on our program yeah, today. Thanks for having and me. Which just goes to show we are an equal Big 12 employer as well as SEC, <laughs> as I went to Mizzou. Uh, that means that you Jayhawk, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, there you go. Listen, I got to see the tickets. I'm one of those Tiger Hawks. I could cheer for both Mizzou and KU. I've seen the tickets to KU basketball. Come on. <laughs> so, Jill Hudad, talk to us a little bit. Final thoughts today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Um, and we weren't scary, right? We didn't. Yeah, we don't have scary. fuzz. I don't have horns. I, well, my kids may think it's I have horns, but. Great start to the week. Um, yeah. No, I have to um, echo your, you know, applaud of Casey's shepherds. They're doing great. And I think, you know, we just we need to think creatively as a community going forward, you know, medical institution and a community going forward about how we can support our older individuals, you know, this next year and meet them where they are and then, you know, help engage them um, so that they can, you know, break that cycle of bed, kitchen, sofa. 
bed, kitchen, sofa. I think I'm going to remember that. I was going to say bed, kitchen, couch, but sofa's better. <laughs> You know, we are all in this together. And whether you're a young person who wants to get vaccinated, a shout out to all those 12 and elders who are getting vaccinated, whether you're young, if you're the 25 year olds who are hospitalized, you're the 42 year olds in Springfield who are being ravaged by this disease. If you're our 60 year olds like myself, or if you're the 80 and 90 year olds, COVID-19 is an equal opportunity destroyer. There's one way to stay safe. You can follow our advice that we've been giving throughout this pandemic. There's still no place like home, and that's true. But sometimes home is not quite enough because social isolation can affect all of us. The way to stay safe and make sure our society stays safe and learning a lesson from the rest of the world where they're beginning to reinstitute restrictions because they don't have enough folks vaccinated. The way to stay safe is to give us your arm and come get a vaccine so we keep you safe, we keep your friends and loved ones safe, we keep our community safe, and ultimately, we keep our world safe. So join the safe crowd. Let's get away from that tough triangle. Let's all stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow.